Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. President Obama made a surprise visit to one housing subdivision in Phoenix affected by the housing crisis. Find out more about how one organization was able to reconstruct the area and make homes available to families. And the story of the Carl Hayden High School robotics team victory is now a movie. We'll talk to one of the coaches and team members about the film. That's all coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. Earlier this month, before President Obama gave a speech at Central High School to speak about housing incentives, he made a surprise visit to Nueva Villas at Beverly, a housing development in the Phoenix South Mountain Corridor, which has been affected by the housing crisis. Chicanos por la Causa, with the help of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, purchased the development and hired local residents to refurbish it. We'll talk more about Nueva Villas in a moment, but first, here's what the president had to say during the unexpected stop. Because of the great work that this nonprofit has done, but also because of assistance from HUD. What the community has been able to do is, through a nonprofit, purchase some of these homes that were empty and vacant, hire local residents to help reconstruct them. And now they're able to make homes available to working families. A family of four that maybe makes Forty or sixty thousand dollars a year has a chance to buy a beautiful home in a terrific neighborhood. The market stabilizing. Joining me now to discuss Nueva Villas at Beverly is Edmundo Hidalgo, president and CEO of Chicanos por la Causa. Edmundo, welcome to Horizonte again. Um, this is pretty special, and as I understand it, it was unexpected. Very much so, Jose. Um, over the holidays, we actually have been contacted about the administration holding an event in Phoenix. And so our expectation was that that morning, uh, the secretary, Secretary Castro, was actually gonna be coming out and doing a site visit on a project that had received funding uh, through the office of, of, of HUD. And uh, so- uh, Of which he, he runs. Which he, that, that's what he leads. And so 30 minutes prior to the visit, uh, Secret Service you know, comes in and says, uh, by the way, you know, the president is coming as well. And so at first it was a great surprise, but then it was a great panic, right? Because we had not prepared, you know, for the president's uh, uh, coming to this particular site. And so, you know, it was uh, 30 minutes of preparation in anticipation of his arrival. So um, I've seen a, a longer version of, of the video we just saw, and it shows you there standing in front of the president and, and your hands are moving a lot. Absolutely. Uh, explaining yeah. what this was all about. I take it he's a quick study and, and, and um, he seemed to have a pretty good grasp of what you guys were trying to do. V very much so. so. So he actually understood the challenge that many of our communities have gone through. Um, he was obviously you know, making a speech you know, later that morning that was going to address you know, some of the changes and some of the administrative uh, decisions that he was making in regards to some of the HUD programs that have been impacting you know, many of our first time home buyers. This is a conversation that we have been having for the last several months with the secretary in regards to higher mortgage insurance payments as well as other barriers that were not permitting for some home buyers and those families that were trying to buy in our communities uh, be able to you know, acquire a loan. And so he was very knowledgeable. He actually understood the situation in the market. He understood the barriers that we were dealing with. Um, and so was there, you know, to get a first-hand view at some of the, the, the market situation that was going on in Arizona, but specifically in South Phoenix. And speaking of a view, we've got some pictures of some of the homes in this particular development. We're going to put them up on the screen. Um, it, 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 I mean, when you think of, of an area that most people consider South Phoenix, they, they also think of it as, as, as pretty run down. But these are gorgeous, gorgeous homes. Tell us about how this came to be. Yeah. So, so this subdivision actually originated as being a 50 home subdivision and as what happened with many other areas, uh, you had a developer that, you know, started to develop these homes, you know, but because of the financial crisis and because of the crash in the market, then it was no longer a viable project. So they built out 25 of the homes, but they left 50 lots vacant. And so over a three, almost four year period, they accumulated, you know, blight, you know, trash and so forth. And so a community that was supposed to be a fully developed 
you know, uh, area was only half built. And so then we had the opportunity to go in and acquire the 25 lots. And over the last year and a half, we have been able to sell eight of the 25 that were remaining. And right now we have offers on seven additional homes. So for us, you know, even prior to the president's visit, you know, we have seen an increase in demand uh, uh, for this type of a product and especially this price point because it's still a very affordable uh, home in this particular subdivision. Now you talked about be even before the president's visit, you'd seen an, an increase in demand. What impact did the president's visit have on all the attendant publicity? Yeah, so um, a lot of it had to do with the remark that he was making and his special interest in trying to help people move up into middle class. And so he recognized, and this is one of the conversations that we're having, that for many families, their home is their single biggest, biggest vehicle in being able to, uh, to accumulate wealth. And so folks in many, many cases don't have stocks, don't have other means you know, to really you know, move up into the middle class. And so through that equity that they're able to build through home ownership, you know, that is how they acquire and that's how they build wealth you know, in many cases. So looking at this particular home as an example of that, the price point in the homes that you saw uh, in, in, on the screen were you know, 135,000 for a three bedroom, two and a half bath. You know, these are homes that use energy efficiency. They use two by six, which is better construction than most, you know, homes. And so really talked about the quality, but also the long-term affordability, you know, in this type of a program. And speaking of equity, one of the unique things about this program, one of the many unique things about this program, is that the purchasers actually do uh, provide some of that with their own sweat, sweat, sweat equity, yeah. uh, so to speak. So, so for us, it's always important to try to bring in value into many of our programs, right? So not only are we looking to hire you know, local contractors from the area, because for us, you know, that shows an investment and that shows you know, local impact, but then we also try to figure out ways to allow the homeowners to uh, earn some of that equity, a sweat equity as well. Um, and so those are just features that we try to incorporate in order to make the home even more affordable. So talk about how people can become eligible for this particular project. And then I want to talk about some of the other things that CPLC is doing in this area. Yeah, so people can con contact our main office, which is 602-257-0700. Uh, we usually start with pre-purchase counseling. We like for individuals to First of all, understand you know, what is the whole mortgage process all about and what is the benefit? Uh, many people often assume that for whatever reason they don't qualify in many cases because they assume that they have bad credit or that they have something uh, in their history that would prevent them from actually acquiring a home. I tell folks, you know, this particular home that we showcase, the payment all in, meaning principal, interest, taxes, and insurance on that particular home is less than $1,100 less than $1,100 for a three bedroom, two and a half home. People are paying more than that in their rental payment. And so often people disqualify themselves because they don't know what the process is all about. So we're always trying to encourage individuals to just, you know what, come and ask questions, come and understand more, go through the education and then determine whether you're really ready or not to be a homeowner at this point. Are there specific requirements though? Do you have to be at a certain income level before you can even apply to get one of these homes? Um, not, not in this particular neighborhood. You know, we actually have a variety of incomes and a variety of price points. You know, something else that we did with this development is that we brought features that, you know, that really brought a community focus. So there's porches, you know, in this particular model. So the garages are actually coming in through the side of the house. We wanted to build a community where people could, could walk outside, where people could actually meet their neighbors and make it more of a community feel to it, you know, than just, you know, row, row houses with a bunch of garages in the front. And so we're hoping that that's what's going to create more community and invite people to really come out, you know, and meet their neighbors. Now, I know that one of the other points of emphasis in some of your other projects, and I wonder if you're doing this here too, is energy efficiency. Absolutely. You know, for us, you know, when, when we look at affordability, when we look at long-term retention of a home, those are the things that sometimes, you know, they don't add a whole lot to the cost of the home, but long-term, the savings, you know, really benefit, you know, the homeowner. So I mentioned the, the construction. So we you know traditionally most homes use a two by four, which is really the size of, of, of the lumber. In this case, we're using two by six. We try to use other features, you know, like, you know, water conservation, you know, better R rating on the insulation. So just things that allow the homeowner to have some true savings 
that over the period of, of, of the 15 years or 30 years, whatever the mortgage is, can really translate some to real, into some real savings. So, um, Edmundo, I know that, that CPLC, like everybody else, had to tighten their belts during, during the downturn. Uh, real estate was one of the areas most affected. Uh, are you now starting to build that all back up? And, and um, last question, what are the projects are there in the, on the horizon for CPLC in yeah. this area? So, so we are seeing uh, an improvement in the economy, an improvement, uh, especially in real estate, um, especially in this price point. Um, what we saw, you know, over the last, you know, eight, nine months was that values, you know, really increased in many areas. Um, and the last several months, you know, things have kind of gotten a little bit flat again. And so you're not seeing those increases in values, but for this price point, and especially for first time home buyers, um, there's a large demand because interest rates are still low and you don't have a large inventory of, of homes, you know, in the price range, you know, that we're selling. So the 150 to $170,000 range, you don't have a lot of properties out there, especially new properties. And so for us, we're really excited of this project, but many projects like this that we have, you know, in Tucson, Nogales, and all over the community that are really making the dream of home ownership a reality. So Edmundo, thanks for joining us to talk about uh, your surprise uh, guest. I understand you've invited him back for the annual dinner. If, yeah. if he accepts, let us know. We'll have you back on to talk Appreciate about it. Appreciate we'll it. We'll, we'll love to have him back, for sure. I'm sure uh, that would be newsworthy as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. It's a local story that has been made into a movie that premiered in theaters across the country last week. In 2004, the Carl Hayden Robotics team won an underwater robotics competition beating many prestigious colleges, a story first reported on Horizonte that year. We'll talk to one of the coaches and team members in a moment, but first, here's a look at spare parts. No formal teaching experience. Uh, no. You've had eight jobs in the last year. You'd probably guess what my follow-up question is gonna be. Where do I get my stamina? <laughs> Four months. If you last that long, it'll be longer than most of my permanent hires. Really, nobody's gonna crack open a book. They're in there. Why do they lock this? So we don't steal them. Are you for the engineering club? I'd like to enter this. The fifth annual underwater robotics competition. So you wanna go up against the best tech schools in the country? It says they scout for internships and jobs. You guys got some ground to make up. The other teams will have more money than you. So you're still short $432.54. And my man ate a couple ice creams on the way in. Can I have an ice cream? Too late. I already wrote the check. Okay, we gotta find cheap, creative ways to build this thing. How do we fix it? You gotta stop this leak. It's small and really absorbent. Every day in a hundred ways they are told that they are worthless that they are beyond hope. The more they need me, the more I start to wonder, am I gonna let them down? You remember everything you said about not giving up? Well, we're not giving up. He's full of surprises. I saw something like this in a horror movie once. Duke University, Virginia Tech, MIT, and Carl Hayden Community High School. This is it. We couldn't do this without you, sir. Those are my boys! The finish line always appears. Think about how far we've come. And everything that we've gained, that no one can take away what we started together. There she is. Go talk to her. Are we looking at a teachable moment? Sure. Hey, I'm trying to show them a lesson about rejection. I need you to slap me hard. I, I can't just slap you out of nowhere. Um, <clears throat> I think women are all horrible teachers. Mm -hmm. Oh! Did you like that? Yes, I like it. Thank you. With me now to talk about the Spare Parts movie are Dr. Alan Cameron, one of the 2004 Carl Hayden Robotics team coaches, Lorenzo Santillan, 2004 robotics team member, and Christian Arcega, another 2004 robotics team member. Well, it feels like old home week. We've had you on the show a number of times, and, and uh, as the article in the Republic mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we're the first ones who covered you in a point of pride and honor for us. But um, I think you all have aged much better than I have over the last 10 <laughs> years. Congratulations, <laughs> by the way, on the movie. Thank you. Um, 
this has been a, a, a great story for a long time. Um, uh, I'm sure it's quite flattering to have George Lopez play you. Actually, he's also uh, uh, playing your colleague. The yeah. two of you are kind of merged into one character here. For the movie, they didn't want two teachers. They wanted one to make it a tighter story. So uh, Freddie uh, Lichvardi, the other teacher, and myself, Alan Cameron, so that the character he plays is Dr. Freddie Cameron. So an amalgam. Yeah. Of the two. Yeah. They, they took some liberties in some other areas, but, but it, this is essentially the story, you think? The feeling and the results is the story. Uh, it's uplifting, it's funny, it's tragic, you laugh, you cry, and in real life, I think that this is our story. <laughs> now, what did you guys think about the movie? Yeah, I mean, uh, they got the whole point that we wanted to get across, and you know, every time we tell our story somewhere, they got it across. I mean, that whole inspirational motivation that we want to give to students in our communities, you know, to aim for higher education goals, to believe in themselves, and to actually see themselves having a bright future. Lorenzo, one of the things that's pointed out both in the article and, and in the movie is, is kind of a tension between you and your father and, and, and a broader issue about uh, Latino families, maybe how they, how they uh, deal with higher education. Uh, how accurate was that? It's pretty accurate. I mean, this highlights a phase of my life that I'm not very proud of, but at the same time, it's what made me who I am. Um, my father was a drunk. He was a, you know, he wasn't a, the greatest father. And I still have him, so I don't blame him for maybe what he has done. But at the same time, I, I wish I could have had like a good, you know, father figure for myself. But at the end of the day, it's it's what it is. But you do have a good father figure. Yes, I do. Who? Ready? Yeah. Sometimes that's the role of a teacher. You become another parent or another big brother, and it pays off in the long run. It's part of the teaching job. And, and in your particular case, a happy ending. I mean, one of the points that was emphasized in, in the article in The Republic was, uh, or the question was, would your father show up for the premiere? And, and, and he did, and he was very proud. Right. Well, I was a little nervous because I thought that he might not show up. And that's been a case of big events in my life. I'm one of those uh, five that graduated. Uh, well, the first one out of my co uh, family of siblings to graduate. Uh, from college and he didn't show up so it just kind of it, it brings back memories like come on dad like you you see that your ch children are succeeding and you're not you're not supporting supporting me in a big event in my life well and and it may not be to the same extent but one of the points that was made Christian in in, in the the movie and and uh, it commented on I think even by George Lopez himself was that sometimes immigrant Latino families the parents have a, a little bit tougher time adjusting to the to the fact that their kids want to go on to college. Oh yeah, I mean it's especially difficult. It was back then when we were in school. I was very fortunate. My parents have always been very supportive of me, but that was not the case for most of my peers. I mean, even now, uh, ten years later after this movie comes out, you know, Latinas and you know Latinos in our school are still having problems where they're having their parents not support their you know higher educational goals, especially in the Latino community where we've actually had parents of students that are getting full ride scholarships to schools outside the state. And you know, they'll tell the teachers, you know, you're breaking up my family because you're sending my little girl to college and, you know, so she can be an engineer. And that's the kind of unfortunate problem that does face a lot of our community. Even that even those individuals that really want to stand out and actually, you know, make something great of their own lives. And it's not because the parents don't want the best for their children, but but it's, they they're not familiar a, yeah, with higher education. Yeah, they're not they're not uh, very understanding or they don't really understand the significance of these accomplishments that their kids actually want to perceive and what it, it actually means to say. You know, a lot of parents, will, most parents will say, well, I want my kids to go to college. And a lot of these uh, in our community especially, they don't really understand the kind of sacrifices that, you know, in terms of not being able to see your family, not having time for your family, even if you're going to school in the state. I mean, even if a uh, Latina student goes to, let's say, ASU, she still won't see her family very much at all because she'll be busy studying every day for eight hours a day. So is, is this movie going to make a difference in that regard, Lorenzo, do you think? I believe so. I mean, people, uh, well, the special preview for the movie was uh, held at Carl Hayden, and the students went wild over it. I mean, even though that the you know actors and talent went, it was besides the point. Like, they didn't know they were there. They were just going so wild for a story that was 
in their you know school and and I think that had they, they had a sense of belonging to it because they all can relate to it and and dr. Cameron uh, on our show we have talked in the past about the particularly difficult role for for Latinas the, the daughters of, of immigrant families in terms of going away from the house but but you've had uh, the robotics program itself has had some rather fantastic stories success stories of Latinas going on to higher education because of the robotics program? It was just a quirk of, of randomness that there were four boys in this story because there's it it's normally half. we're yeah. half girls, half... Um, you mean uh, on the original yeah. team as well? Yes, yes, yes. We On all our robotics teams, it, it, it about 50% it's, it's, it's girls, about 50, really. 50. But more importantly, the girls get turned on to engineering, mathematics, and they go on to college. But what's very unusual is they graduate with the engineering degrees. Nationally, just generally, 50% of the kids drop out of engineering. Even at ASU, if an incoming engineering crowd is 200 kids, only 100 are gonna graduate with an engineering degree. And so when you see women graduating with an engineering degree, they're five, 10% of the graduating class. Latino women, uh, we have a joke, if you ever run into a Latino engineer, ask her what year she graduated from Carl Hayden. <laughs> so there's been a great success story there. And speaking of stories, um, this was originally covered in Wired magazine um, by Joshua Davis, and he's now written a book, and we'll maybe get a close-up of, of the cover of the book. Um, uh, so you, 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 you've got a book. It's been in hardcover, uh, now, now paperback, and, and the movie. Where do things go from here? We'll see. We hope the movie, and especially the book, not only is it entertaining, it's funny, and it's sad, and it's, we hope people will talk about it when they walk out of the theater. There's a lot of meat in there to talk about. There's immigration, there's family dynamics, there's group dynamics, there's how come we have to hustle so hard for a robotics program in a high school that probably spends tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars on after school sports. Which one are the kids going to make a living at? The kids aren't going to go into professional sports. They may think they do. What if they were, instead of all of that energy and time and resources, going into sports, which isn't necessarily bad, also went into after school academics? Where, where, where do the brainiacs go for, for fun after school? Where do the kids that want a safe place to stay after school and work with other kids without being hassled, where do they go? Why now, can't that be a school function? You know, we've, we've touched on this a little bit, uh, particularly in your case, Lorenzo, but, but how accurate do you and your colleagues, um, your fellow teammates, feel that, that the movie portrayed you and your circumstances? Uh, my character in particular is very different. I mean, in the, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but my character gets bullied a lot in high school and the movie, that wasn't really the case. But I understand they had to change some of the general dynamics because when you work on a good team, everybody acts similarly. Everybody is always gets, gets along pretty well. They're all doing and sharing time to, with the same resources and doing the same tasks. And especially because our team was so small and we had such a time crunch, it wouldn't have made very good movies if everybody was portrayed more accurately. I mean, you wouldn't have wanted to see, you know, six hours of us working on the robot every day. But it was a good movie, one worth seeing. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, especially. Yeah. It, I mean, you had to include some of that general dynamics. And we were very happy about it because, you know, we think about this movie project and there's like, you know, there's six guys on this team. They're gonna turn somebody into a girl. Somebody's <laughs> gonna get turned into the girl. So I think we were all much more pleased with, you know, I'm sure he was more pleased about getting turned into Dr. You know, uh, Federico Cameron than, you know, showing up as a female. <laughs> well, how about getting it? slapped by Marissa Tomei? That, I take it that didn't really happen. Uh, uh, boy, don't I wish. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? No, I, both Freddie and I are married. We didn't have girlfriends at the time, but uh, that's, part of Hollywood. We're almost out of time, Lorenzo. Uh, uh, what has all this meant to you? I mean, it's, it's been a long journey. There's been a lot of steps along the way. What kind of impact has it had? Well, it's given me an opportunity to go to college to uh, change my life for the better and to have an education. And now that I have, have, have had the opportunity to go to college and graduate, I've experienced a real world uh, res re working in a restaurant at the end of the day, I love cooking, and you see some scenes of me cut, chopping out some stuff on the, on the uh, movie. You and end up going a, to culinary school. Yeah, it's a tribute to that, and I think that now I want to open up my own business, and I need some help. So I have a website set up. It's called LorenzosDream.com, 
and uh, I just want to ask people to help me out, uh, start it up. Yeah, and I'm in a similar situation. I have been able to get the funds to go to college, so I'm doing a crowdfunding project so I can go back to school in the fall at uh, collegestream.help. And I still want to be a, an engineer. Well, it's a great story. We're, we're pleased that we've had a, a chance to be part of it. And thank you all for joining us on Horizonte to, to revisit this wonderful story. And hopefully you'll, you'll get a lot of people watching the movie. Hopefully we'll have something new next time. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and that's our show for tonight from all of us here at 8 in Horizonte. Thank you for watching. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.